Bell bows down. Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop down and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnants of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and grey hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. With whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make into a god and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up on its place and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Remember this, keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfil my purpose. What I have said, I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted. You who are now far from my righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendour to Israel. Back in 2005, the American novelist David Foster Wallace was asked to give the commencement address to a group of graduating students at a liberal arts college in Ohio in the States. His address was later published as a book, and what he said that day had a big impact on a lot of people. David Foster Wallace, he was an acclaimed author, novelist, thinker. He wasn't a Christian, but I want to begin our time in Isaiah chapter 46 with an excerpt from his speech that day. See, midway through his speech to graduating students, Wallace says this. Here's something that's weird, but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? And I think it immediately helps to open up this next section of the book of Isaiah for us today and to show us that in spite of initial appearances Isaiah's message here is still hugely relevant to us even though we're living over 2,500 years after Isaiah was writing. So the original readers of Isaiah were the people of Judah living in exile in Babylon 500 years before the coming of Jesus into the world and in Isaiah 46 the prophet Isaiah is asking them a question. Who or what are you going to live for in your lives? Who or what are you going to trust in now? Or to put it more directly in the language of Isaiah and in the language of David Foster Wallace in that speech, who or what are you going to worship in your life? Are you going to continue to worship idols, false gods, or are you going to worship the living God, who alone can save you, sustain you, and carry you. See, since at least back in Isaiah 44, Isaiah has been relentless in his attempts to show his readers the foolishness, even the madness, of worshipping anything other than the living God of Scripture. Again and again in these chapters, Isaiah makes his case against idol worship. 
But of course, the minute we hear someone say idol worship, we, we say to ourselves, well, that's got nothing to do with me. You know, that's, that's nothing to say to me. I've never been tempted to worship a statue of wood or metal. I've got plenty of temptations in my life, but that's just never been one of them. But in response to that reaction, let me point you to David Foster Wallace again. There is no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. So whether or not he knew it, I'm convinced that David Foster Wallace is simply echoing the message of the Bible here. The more I've read the Bible, the more I've gotten to know people, the more I've gotten to know myself, the more convinced I am that we're all, when it comes down to it, worshippers. We are worshippers in search of something or someone to save us and satisfy us. The American pastor, Tim Keller, defines an idol like this. He says, it is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Now, according to that definition, anything can be an idol. The idol you trust in could be the idol of your health, the idol of your career, the idol of your marriage, the idol of your family or your children. The idol you trust in could be the respect and good opinion of other people. It could be physical beauty. It could be physical safety. It could be your home, your car, your devices. Now, idols can be good things in and of themselves, but the problem is we make them too important to us. See, we want these things and these people to save us and satisfy us in and of themselves, when they were never designed by God to do that. I mean, just take a moment now and just think to yourself, what might be the idols of your life? What are the things or the people you might be looking to, to save you and satisfy you in your life at the moment? See, once we understand idols and what the Bible calls idolatry, the worship of idols, we quickly realise that we are all idol worshippers. And in case you think, well, maybe if we're all idol worshippers, it's not that big a deal. Listen to the next bit of David Foster Wallace's speech. See, he argues there that if we choose to worship anything other than a real God, it will eat you alive, he says. He goes on, if you worship money and things, if that is where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Or he says, worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths. Can you hear what he's saying? Worshipping a false god isn't just a harmless bit of fun. No, both David Foster Wallace and Isaiah agree who we choose to worship is actually a matter of life and death. I mean, listen again to the note of urgency in Isaiah 46, the way God is pleading with his people in these verses. Verse 3, God says, Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnants of the people of Israel. Verse 12, listen to me, you stubborn hearted, you who are now far from my righteousness. Or verse 8, remember this, keep it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. We might ask, well, why is God so urgent here? Why does he plead with his people to remember what he's telling them about worshipping false gods? Well, it's because the Lord knows something. Worshipping a false god really will eat you alive. False gods cannot save us. False gods cannot satisfy us. And false gods just always demand more and more from us. See, God's tone is urgent when he's pleading here because he loves us. God wants to set us free from the worship of false gods who cannot save us and who will only enslave us. That is why this passage is in our Bibles. So let's look at Isaiah 46 together now. If you've got a Bible, please have it open. 
at Isaiah 46. Now we can break this passage down into the following sections, two of which focus on false gods and two of which lift our eyes to the true and living God. So verses 1 to 2, false gods are a burden to us. Verses 3 to 4, the true God carries us. Verses 5 to 7, false gods cannot save us. Verses 8 to 13, the true God alone can save us. So let's look at those sections looking at false gods first. First of all, verses 1 to 2, false gods are a burden to us. Verses 1 to 2, false gods are a burden to us. Now Isaiah names two false gods in verses 1 to 2. Bel, he was the chief god of Babylon, and Nebo, the son of Bel, the god of writing and wisdom. And sort of fun fact, Nebo is where the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar got his name from. There you go, pub quiz. Now what unites both these Babylonian gods in Isaiah's eyes is the fact that they are both so heavy. Isaiah pictures their worshippers having to move their statues and they're nearly crushed by the weight. Verse 1, the images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. See, far from being able to help their worshippers, far from making life more bearable, these false gods actually add to the weight their worshippers have to carry. The false gods of Babylon take rather than give to their worshippers. And the same is true of any false god you trust in today. Try to live up to their demands and you will be crushed under the weight. I must have the perfect family. I must have the perfect career. I must have the perfect life. I just need a little more money and then I'll be satisfied. I just need a husband or a wife or children or a different husband or a different wife or different children and then I'll be happy. But see, Isaiah is warning us here. If we live for these idols, these false gods, they will never be satisfied. They will never stop demanding more from us. The theologian Mike Reeves puts it like this. He says, All idols, all false gods are black holes of neediness. False gods are only ever a burden to us. And then verses 5 to 7, false gods cannot save us. Verses 5 to 7, false gods cannot save us. So according to these verses, false gods only ever take from us. That's verse 6. You have to pay for the privilege of worshipping them. So for Isaiah's original readers, they had to pay for a goldsmith to manufacture their God to worship. Now for us today, there's also always a payment required. Whether that payment is in money to keep up with everyone else or, or time to try and get as good at things as everyone else or anxiety, the fear you'll never quite make it. And after all that effort and expense, verse 7, false gods cannot save us. See, once a false god is set up in its place in our lives, verse 7, from that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer, it cannot save them from their troubles. Listen again to God's damning indictment of false gods. It cannot move. It cannot answer. It cannot save. God is trying to help us see the madness of looking to a false god of our own making to save and satisfy us. See, a false god only ever takes from us. A false god cannot save us. And if you ever fail to live up to the standard of your chosen idol, whether that's success or popularity or beauty or wealth, well, you'll discover a false god does not forgive us when we fail. False gods don't know how to forgive. They only know how to demand from us. A false god will not catch you when you fall. A false God doesn't know how to forgive. Isaiah 46 makes it clear. False gods are only a burden 
to us. False gods cannot save us. False gods will eat us alive if we live for them. An idol is something which needs us and which keeps on taking and taking from us. But the true God By contrast, the God of the gospel, the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the God who gives to us. He's the God who cares for us. He's the God who forgives us when we fail. And for the rest of our time in Isaiah 46, I want us to lift our eyes to this true living God. I hope you can see in this chapter that a key word here is the word carry. So back in verses one to two, an idol needs people to carry it. It's a burden for the weary. But by contrast, in verses three to four, the true God carries us. The true God carries us. Again, we get such a beautiful and tender picture of God in verses three to four. Let me read verse three for us again. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. See, here we learn that that the Lord has upheld and carried his people since he first created them. Long before they could give anything back to him, long before they could do anything for him, God has cared for his people. See, God isn't here to take from us. He's here to give to us. And look at verse four again. It's because here the Lord looks to the future and what he will do for his people in that future. He says, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. See, God's care for and presence with his people is for the whole of our lives. The more I see grey hairs in the mirror, the more precious and meaningful this promise of God becomes for me. And verse 4 continues with yet more promises. He says, I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. I will carry you, says God. He's telling us here he's the complete opposite of the false gods of verses 1 to 2. They need to be carried by us. But actually the true God, well, doesn't need us at all. And at first glance, that that sounds like a discouraging thought. Well, God doesn't need me. Does that mean he doesn't care about me? Does that mean I'm expendable to him? But no, God says here, God is not indifferent to us. He's not unfeeling towards us. God doesn't need us but he wants us. He doesn't need us in his people, but he wants us in his people. See, Christians don't worship a needy God. God doesn't actually need us to accomplish any of his purposes in this world, but amazingly, out of his love for us, God delights to have us partner with him. God does work with us and through us for his purposes, not because he needs us, but because he loves us as his children, because he wants us by his side, working with him in this world. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. And that is such good news for us. Verse four goes on. I will sustain you. Now, for Isaiah's original readers, that was a promise to keep them going through 70 years of exile in Babylon. For us today, well, I believe that as a church family, we've experienced so much of God's sustaining power of us over the past year and a bit. It hasn't been an easy year. It hasn't always been pretty. But, but God has sustained us as a church family over the last few months. And the promise here is he will continue to sustain us as we look to the future. That is the God he is, the God who sustains his people. And the final part of verse four, I will rescue you, says the Lord. The true God alone has the power to rescue us from our sin and from the consequences of our sin. Now again, for Isaiah's original readers, that was a promise that God would one day bring them home from exile in Babylon. He did that after 70 years. We can read about that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament. 
But for us today, that is a promise that God will rescue us from the eternal punishment our sin deserves. And he tells us more about how he will do that in the closing verses of the chapter, verses 8 to 13. Here we learn it's the true God who can save us. The true God can save us. In verses 8 to 13, we learn that when God saves his people, he does so in unexpected ways. So again, for Isaiah's original readers, that meant God was going to use a foreign king to rescue them and bring them home. Look at verse 11 again. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. Now that's a reference to Cyrus, the king of Persia. The king he would eventually conquer and overthrow the Babylonian Empire in the year 538 BC. The king who would then allow the Jewish people to go home. See, against all expectations, God was going to use a Gentile king, a king who didn't even believe in him, to accomplish his purposes in this world. See, the true God who saves us does so in unexpected ways. And fast forward to us today. How does God save us from our sin? Well, he does it by sending us his only son. He does it by Jesus humbling himself and becoming a man, living among us and then willingly giving his life for us, going to a cross for us to take the punishment our sins deserve, the punishment our worship of idols deserves. See, the true God saves in unexpected ways. And that's what makes him so glorious and so worth trusting in. We also get a glimpse of the transforming power of God's saving grace in verses 12 to 13. See, verse 12 reminds us that naturally, left to our own devices, we are all of us stubborn hearted. We are all far away from God's righteousness, verse 12. But then, well, verse 13 shows us God's response to that situation. I am bringing my righteousness near, he says. It is not far away. See, God doesn't condemn us or abandon us to our sin. No, he brings his righteousness near to us in the person of his son, Jesus. Jesus shares his righteousness with everyone who puts their faith in him, with everyone who admits, I cannot save myself. I need to be rescued from my sin, from my tendency to trust in false gods. I need to be forgiven and washed clean by Jesus. The true God delights to save and forgive people who humble themselves before him. You see, unlike the false gods we often trust in, Christians worship a God who knows how to forgive. So as we near the end of this time in Isaiah 46, we need to go back to the question we started with. Who or what are you worshipping? in your life right now? Who or what are you looking to to save you and satisfy you in your life right now? And in that worship relationship, who's carrying who? Who's the one who gives and who's the one who takes? Does the God you trust in need you to carry it? Or does the God you trust in carry you? Does the God you trust in take from you? Or does the God you trust in give everything for you and everything to you? See, in this passage, Isaiah reminds us of a glorious truth. The true God is not here to take from us. He's here to give to us. The true God gives us his righteousness, his forgiveness, his son as a ransom for our sin. And I wonder, is that how you usually think about the God of the Bible? As a God who gives rather than takes? Reading over this passage this week, I've been struck that often I, I can think of God, oh, he just, he's always demanding things from me. He's always asking things of me. And I think that's part and parcel of the spiritual battle we are in. 
Ever since the Garden of Eden, the devil, Satan, has worked hard to portray God as someone who's always taking from us, as a God who is not good, a God who is not generous. But you see, Isaiah 46 is here in our Bibles to put us right. God is not here to take from us. Instead, he delights to give to us, to rescue us from sin and death, to sustain us in this fallen world, to carry us and the weights we cannot carry on our own. So as we leave Isaiah 46 now, what difference will knowing the true God make to our lives this week? There are two takeaway applications that stand out for me. The first is this. Let's be sure we're putting our trust in the living God. Let's be sure we're worshipping him rather than worshipping false gods who cannot save us. Let's listen to God's word here, verse 8. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart. Let's turn away from false gods. Let's stop looking to anyone or anything else to save and satisfy us. And instead, let's put our trust wholeheartedly in the God of grace, the God who alone can save us and carry us. And secondly, let's go to God this week and ask him to carry us and sustain us in the details of our lives. I mean, just think for a moment, what are the weights you have to carry in your life right now? What are the things that are bearing down on you? Maybe it's worries about your family or your friends. Maybe it's the pressures of your job. Maybe it's worries about the future and what that will look like. See, God's word to all of us in Isaiah 46 is this. You do not have to carry those weights on your own. More than that, you were never meant to carry those weights on your own. No, the God of grace is here to carry us and to carry the things we cannot carry on our own. So talk to him about what is weighing you down. Ask him to help you and strengthen you and then place your full weight in his hands. I think the picture we get in verse four is the picture almost of a child who is so tired, they cannot keep walking on their own. All they can do is lift their arms up to their mum or dad. And maybe even without saying anything, they're communicating, I'm tired. I can't go on my own. Please, will you carry me? And Isaiah 46 tells us that is a request God promises to answer. The God of the gospel, the God of the Bible, is the God who carries us, who sustains us, who rescues us. That doesn't mean those problems magically disappear or there's no more weights to carry. What it does mean is that God comes alongside us. He walks alongside us in our lives. And more than that, he carries us when we cannot keep going on our own. That is his grace towards us. He is committed to you and he is committed to helping you keep going for him if you'll only ask him to, if you'll ask him to carry you in repentance and faith in Jesus. So let's be people who take God at his word this week and in the weeks to come. Let me finish with those words of verse four again. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. (laughs) 